And I'm so glad you could join us today for a look at creating a bee-friendly garden. Bees are a bit of a hidden treasure in our yards. We all know about the ever-present honeybees and the bumblebees are hard to miss, they're so big. But there are almost 700 bee species here in Oregon and they mostly go unnoticed. Today, we're going to take a deeper look into the secret world right outside your door. <clears throat> bee populations are in decline due to a combination of human caused stressors, parasites and pests, pathogens, poor nutrition, pesticides. And often when someone says the word bee, people picture a honeybee. They're social bees that congregate together in very large colonies of 40,000 to 100,000. But 90% of the bees in our world are solitary bees who do not colonize or have hives. Of those 70% are ground dwelling, creating small solitary nests underground with nothing but a small hole to indicate their presence. Urban gardeners can help provide a refuge space for wild bees. A bee refuge contains flowering plants, species for food, and both soil and cavity nesting sites can help minimize the adverse impact on pollinators. <clears throat> there have been 4,337 species of bees identified in North America and Hawaii. We only have the conservation status of 7.3% that's 317 species out of 4,337. Of those, only 133 species are considered to be conservationally secure. That means 184 of the very small number of bees that we can identify are vulnerable to extinction. And the other 4,207, we just don't know how they're doing. The exciting news is that Oregon is the first state in the nation to form a master melatologist program of trained community scientists dedicated to preserving and cataloging bees that are native to the state. Intensively trained volunteers carry out meticulous work of locating and cataloging the bees in our state, some of which have never been seen before. It's exciting when they find a bee that we didn't know existed here. As I was doing my research, the numbers kept climbing from 500 a few years ago to almost 700 today. Another effort to identify bees in their habitat is the Pacific Northwest Bumblebee Atlas. I had the great fun of being part of that project team of citizen scientists. Oregon and Washington were divided into grid cells that volunteers could adopt. The mission was to go out and capture bumblebees in a specified time period, chill them, note the floral host, and then photograph them for identification. After they warmed up, they flew away, no harm done. And anyone can be a citizen scientist and contribute data about bumblebee sightings. All you need is a camera. It is this work and the Master Melatologist program that is increasing our knowledge of the diversity and wonder of the bees in the Pacific Northwest. It serves to establish a baseline of bee diversity and health to measure against in the future. By learning differences in bee nesting sites and behavior, you may become more aware of the bees in your garden. So that's the first of our objectives today. Then we're gonna take a few minutes to talk about managed bees like mason bees and honey bees that we know fairly well. And then we'll hit the 10 strategies you can incorporate to make your your yard more bee friendly. I want you to note that at the end of this slide uh, presentation, we will have a list of resources and that will be also available when you get the recorded link sent to you, you will have a list of resources. So don't feel like you need to take notes and make sure you get all of the resources listed. <laughs> Part of my goal in doing a presentation like this is to point you to areas where you can do your own further uh, exploration of things you're interested in. Uh, there's just too much to cover to go over it all. So I just wanna give you the tools to find out what you need to know. Hey, let's first take a look at social bees. The two most well-known bees in our area are both in the social classification. Both bumblebees and honeybees are often the first bees you see in the spring. 
And it's not uncommon for them to be seen on a nice day in February or March with temperatures up to in the 70s this weekend, I'm sure we're going to be seeing a lot of bees. Bumblebees have much smaller colonies and are much smaller than honeybee hives. They don't make honey, but they do have a division of labor in foraging and taking care of the brood. Honeybees, the average colony number is 60,000 and it can go up to 100,000. There's only one queen per colony, but she can lay 2,000 eggs a day. They have a lifespan of two to five years, so they own, so they can live over long periods of years. Typical is two to three. Um, when the hive is getting too big, the queen will lay another queen egg and some drones, and they will mate, um, mature mate, and go out and start a new colony. They're capable of communicating floral, floral resource lo locations and they can travel up to three miles. So I wanted to show you a waggle dance. And this is how a bee who has found a great source of uh, flowers goes back to the hive and tells the others where it could be. And think about this, this could be like over for two miles. So when a bee finds food, they go back to the nest to tell the colony where it is. They communicate the direction of the source by how they angle their bodies. So you can see she's traveling in the same direction over and over again, and that's telling the other bees around her where to go. But sometimes there's a dangerous thing hidden in the bees. And the bee that's telling the other bees where to go, if one of her sisters knows that there's something dangerous there, she will headbutt the bee that's doing the waggle dance and tell her to stop, don't go there. This is not where we're supposed to go. And this is a per perfect example. If you can see the uh, um, crab spider here has already gotten a bee and she'd seen, she could have seen that and said, okay, let's go look for someplace else, some other source of, of uh, nutrition. Okay, bumblebees. One of the things that they do that honeybees cannot is they're buzz pollinators. They live again in a nest, um, not in a hive like the bees, the managed bees do. They live in a nest underground or possibly in a tree cavity. They're very, they have long tongues and they can buzz pollinate. And buzz pollination is advantage when some flowers that have store their pollen in enclosed at the tip of the anthers and then the bees grab onto that anther and then buzz really, really fast with their wings. And that opens up the, the anther and lets the pollen come out. Then she grooms the pollen, puts it on her hairs and from the hairs and puts them in a pollen basket on her legs. But not every grain is captured and that is deposited in the next flower. Honeybees have a typically uh, we top out about 400 individuals. So compare that to a, I'm sorry, a bumblebee 400. And honeybee has 60,000. So they're quite a bit smaller in terms of their nest size. Next classification is the solitary bees. And I often think of them as the single working mom. She works so hard for her family and she doesn't get any help from anybody. Males emerge first in their cycle. They mate and then they die and then the mom does all the rest. After they're finished provisioning their nest and laying the eggs, um, she dies. And then the next generation won't emerge for another nine to 10 months. Cavity nesting bees, of the solitary bees, 30% are cavity nesting. And they need cavities in things like dead wood and hollow stems, brush piles, and they also use um, cavities that are provided for the managed bees that are provided by humans like um, laminate blocks and tubes. And sometimes they make poor choices in where they build their nest. If you look at the uh, electrical outlet here, um, some poor, not too bright bee has laid eggs in there. That's not a recipe for success. Ground nesting bees make up the other 70% of solitary bees. They need access to bare soil. And those solitary, some species will nest 
kind of close together. They may even use the same hole to get into underground, but then they have their separate little condominium nurseries in that area. The last thing we're gonna talk about is parasitic bees. And they don't collect pollens. They raid another bee's nest and lay their eggs on, on that bee's pollen ball. Their eggs mature first and devour the larva of the host bee or they devour all the pollen balls so there's nothing left when the larva hatches. Bees that take on, there are parasitic bees that take on a honeybee nest and they have a harder time of it because they've got to end up having to kill some of the worker bees who are trying to defend the hives. And this little guy right here, the white striped painted dark bee was a parasitic bee that I found in one of my mason bee uh, houses. It means she's scoped out things here and she's getting ready to go in. And I didn't stop her because it was just fascinating to watch what she was doing. Now that we know a bit more about the habits and lifestyles of the bees in your backyard, let's explore ways that we can help them thrive. We're going to go through 10 different things and we'll start with the best practices for managed bees. Urban beekeeping has become very popular and many people in cities around the world have started keeping more bees. One problem with this is that each of those colonies needs acres of flowers and there's not enough room for that in urban areas. Another problem is that many of these beekeepers are new to beekeeping and don't know how to keep their colonies healthy. Since there are more, many more colonies close to each other, urban bees can become a hotbed of honeybee pests and diseases. Both honeybees and native bees do better when honey bee colony numbers are limited and there are enough flowers to support all of them. Some urban bee areas are home to native bees that are at risk of extinction and need all the help that they can get to survive. And this art, this is a publication by the Xerxes Society on why getting a hive won't necessarily save the bees. So the basic thing is, if you're interested in saving bees, focus on creating habitat and not honeybees. So manage bees in the, in the home garden. They're manipulated in some fashion. When we provide nesting materials, we take them out, we clean them, we put them in the refrigerator for the winter so that they stay cold. There's just lots of different things we can do. Um, but it's really fun to actually be a part of their lifestyle and watch the whole um, thing as, as they mature and start pollinating our crops. I know that in our garden, our apple and pear trees have really increased with, the, with adding the uh, blue orchard bees. Honeybees, researchers estimate that wild bee populations provide half of the crop pollination services worldwide, but the other half is that honeybees do that. They're the mainstay of managed bee pollination due to the numbers in each hive and that they can be transported from place to place. They will forage on pretty much anything, although they don't have the ability to uh, pollinate things that need buzz pollinating like tomatoes. Um, to manage honeybees, you need to have training and special equipment and clothing. So it's a, quite a bit more complicated than just doing mason bees, but you get honey. So the managed bees that we have that, that people work with, um, mason bees again are probably one of the easiest for the home gardeners. Leaf cutter bees are becoming more popular these days, um, more availability. What's available like to buy online or something is usually the alfalfa leaf cutter bee, which is not native to our area, but they could manage to do okay here. We do have three natural, three native leaf cutter bees in the Portland area. So if you put out leaf cutter bee houses, you might, and have some uh, alfalfa leaf cutter bees, you might also get some of the native bees taking advantage of that. One of the things I wanna point out in this picture is look at all of the pollen on this little bee belly. Uh, Mason bees, most 
solitary bees are covered with hair. They're very furry. And that really is great for pollen transfer. Bumblebees are managed bees also, but that's usually just in greenhouse situations. Um, they can travel, they can breed a hive of honeybees and move them from greenhouse to greenhouse. One of the problems with that is that some of them, they get, because of the close proximity, again, it's easy to develop pathogens and pests. And if they escape, then they take that out into the wild population. Alkali bees um, are another managed bee, but they're not kept in containers. The only way to, to manage an alkali bee is to provide a great source of nesting, ground nesting area. And it's very precise, very dry, and alkaline um, soil. And they've really developed a really great way of having just acres of these bees. Um, but again, that's not something for the home garden. So the difference in how managed bees can help you out, um, mason bees can do the work of 700 honeybees um, because of the, the, the pollen that they can carry on their bodies. Honeybees basically get the pollen and they take it and they put it in their pollen baskets and they take it back to the nest. Um, mason bees are, um, and leaf cutter bees are just messier. They hit the flower and it gets all over them and then they transfer that pollen from flower to flower. So managed cavity nesting bees. Uh, they, mason bees use mud to separate their egg cases. And they're excellent for apples, pears, and almonds, active from mid-March to June. But then in the fall, they should be cleaned and stored. You don't want to take out your cocoons right after they're finished in June. You want to put them away someplace. But then over the summer, they will develop into a fully formed adult bee, but they'll still be, be in the cocoon. So you, it's, that's a time where you can take the cocoons out clean them, get rid of all the parasites, which will go over in just a few minutes, and then um, put them in the refrigerator and keep them cold until it's time for them to go back to work. So leaf cutter bees use flowers instead of mud to separate their different uh, egg chambers. And as I was cleaning my uh, mason bees this fall and there was just so much dried mud around and then I started thinking about leaf cutter bees and I thought well if I'm going to clean my bees if I'm going to be a good uh, bee person I'm going to clean those it'd be way more fun to do with bees that are encased in flowers and leaves than in mud so that's something I'm thinking about doing this so the cocoons are harvested in the fall and then they're held in storage, but they're, they're not cleaned. You can't put um, leaf cutter bee cocoons in the water. That's not how they're, they're made. So basically you take the leaf cutter bees out and you just put them away. And then the way you get them to hatch is they incubate at about 70 degrees. So you bring them out when the temperatures are warmed up and then hatch, and then they will, they can use the same houses as mason bees. You just have different liners and tubes to take care of them. So here's a leaf cutter bee life cycle. They emerge and mate, well, this will be coming out. Look at this picture of this bee carrying a little um, section of leaf to her nest. And here's a pollen ball. There's the larva, the, then they stop until spring, and then when it gets warm again, then they go out and they develop then and emerge and do their work. So nutritional resources for bees. Be aware that the flower resources in your area when planning to bring bees into your yard, make sure that they have sufficient resources to support them if you're working with mason bees within 300 feet of where they'll be active, they do not have the ability to travel. So if you don't have the resources when they hatch, they will go elsewhere. And if they can't find anything close enough, they will die. 
So um, on the right, here's a publication, and this is about honeybees and how best to manage them in urban and suburban areas. And one of their recommendations is to limit the number of hives. Make sure that you're not putting too many hives in an area because they can travel so far, but they can also use up all of the resources available for native bees. So I'm gonna just hammer on this cleaning uh, the mason bees or any um, bee that you're managing carefully. These are some of the things that can um, get in your, this is a particularly ugly mason bee thing, but these are these other things are mites. Um, the black is frass, but then some of the things that you can find in your mason bee tubes would be again, the mites, and they can get so heavy that they can keep a honeybee or a bee, I'm sorry, from flying. They just, there would be the weight of too many mites keeps them from flying and then they die. Um, here's wasps, little teeny tiny wasps that can basically lay an egg in the cocoon. And then that will take care of that bee. And the Houdini fly is one of the big things that we're worried about right now. This was just discovered in Washington in uh, a couple of years ago. And it's basically really had a, a sad effect on the bees in, um, in the UK. It's tiny, it's just a little like, like a fruit fly, but it's a kleptoparasite. And they're found in the past few years, again in Washington and now recently in Portland. They lay eggs in the chamber, the females preparing for her eggs and the Houdini hives eggs hatch first, eat all the pollen and leaving the mason bee larva to starve. So if you do not take care of your of your uh, mason bee cocoons or your leaf cutter bee cocoons, these things just breed and breed and breed, and they will have a really bad effect on our populations of bees. Okay, let's get on to something else now, pesticide free zone. Pesticides rarely solve the problem that allows the pests to flourish. And there are so many alternatives that are so much easier and safer to do for both the bees and people. Pestis insecticides can kill the good, side, good guys and having a few holes in your plant is a sign of a thriving ecosystem. Pesticide free is good for bees. So integrated pest management, it's basically a way to create a healthy plant development and beneficial insects that are less hospitable to pests and diseases. One of the first things you do is to set your action threshold, develop a tolerance for imperfection. It's much better to have a few holes in your leaves and spray pesticides that not only kills the culprit, but every bee and butterfly that dines on the same plant and the bird that eats the bee for lunch. It's a cycle of death. Monify, monitor and identify your pests. Not all insects, weeds, and other living organisms require control. If action must be taken, identify the problem and the least toxic solution is best. And this is one of my favorite um, IPM solutions. Insecticides that contain the active ingredient Pyrethrin are effective chemical control against aphids. But apart from killing the aphids instantly, pyrethrin can be detrimental to natural predators. They're equally dangerous to bees, especially when they come in contact with them. But ladybug larvae are voracious. One larva will eat 400 aphids in the three weeks before it pupates. While ladybug's favorite food, food seems to be aphids, they also will prey on soft scale, white fly, pupa, thrips, and spider mites if no aphids are available. Besides other insects, lady beetles also feed on pollen. One of the things that you know people love to do is to get a nice batch of ladybugs from their local nursery. And that's a wonderful idea. Just 
beware of when you put them out. So it's best like to put them out in the evening and make sure that there's a water source for them because they're thirsty. Um, and I'm not talking a big bowl of water, but like wet leaves and stuff. And then when they wake up in the morning, they're refreshed and they can start looking around. Um, but there's not a huge success rate of when you put ladybugs out in your garden that they're going to stay there. Um, they just need to have find the right food. Neonicotinoids. Neonix, easier to say. And when I first heard of neonics, I thought this was just what an amazing thing. The plant will be protected from aphids and sucking insects, and I don't have to spray pesticides. And then I learned that they travel throughout a plant via its vascular system, and the chemicals go to all parts of the plant, and they can last there for up to three years. It's highly toxic to bees. So when you look for tags on plants, look for something that says neonic free. And we'll talk about that a little bit later too. There's also an article um, buying bee safe plants from the Xerxes Society. So number three in our list of things to do to make a bee friendly garden, plant trees and shrubs. And why did I start here? Well, when you're designing a landscape, the first things you usually figure out where they're gonna go are trees and large shrubs. So that's where we're gonna to start too. Some of the best pollinator plants in our region are shrubs and trees. They include fruit trees, particularly cherries and apples, which have abundant and nutritious pollen and high concentrations of nectar. They're also um, good for forage and for nest, bee nest, and they provide resources to other wildlife. This is a poster from the Pollinator Partnership uh, from 2016. And I just love, it's much bigger than this section that you're seeing, but you can see all the flowers and then there's a little cavity nesting. Um, it's just such full of life. And that's really what our, our flowers can, our trees can do. Uh, OSU Extension has a thing called Shrubs and Trees for Bees. And they've got a great list. And these are two of uh, the favorite for my, in the spring, red flowering currant and the Oregon grape. And they've got a whole bunch more on that list. I think there was about 50. This is one of my favorite books and I take it with me every time I go to the nursery, um, just for my reference. And so I can show other people at the nursery if I can get them to talk to me. Um, these are trees that are native to the, this covers all native plants, but this particular, I looked up like vine maple and it has, it tells you um, how big it's going to get, if it's hard or easy to grow, what kind of rainfall it needs, and then what it supports. So beneficial insect, bees, birds, and then where it grows. So in this list, um, in this native plants for Willamette Valley Yards, which is downloadable on the internet, um, here are the lists that they have available in our area. And of these, I have everything but the bitter cherry, I think, in my yard. Provide year-round floral resources. Now, when I was preparing this talk, I did a very informal Facebook survey. And the question was, what are your favorite flowers for bees? And most of the garden, most of the website pages that are groups that I belong to are gardening, surprise, surprise. Um, and they have um, some really knowledgeable people on there. And I got a list of 80 different flowers that are favorites for people, for bees. But you know what came out top? Dandelions and lavender, neck and neck. So plant a variety of shape and plant families. Um, long tongue bees like bumblebees uh, visit flowers with bilateral symmetry and with a longer flower length, such as vetches and clovers. Uh, lupins are a huge favorite of the bumblebees in my yard. Short tongue bees, which most of the major bee families, including mining bees and sweat bees, prefer easily accessible Composite flowers, think daisies kind of thing, made up of multiple simple flowers, such as sunflower. 
To ensure that a broad array of pollinators benefit from plants in your landscape, include plants across different plant families with a broad range of flower types. These include plants with disc flowers, urn-shaped flowers, and flowers with bilateral symmetry. Check the bloom time. Remember that honeybees and uh, bumblebees can be active easily 10 months out of the years. So this is a chart that I have from a, uh, a program that I have on my computer, but you can do something like this easily on a piece of graph, graph paper if you want. And remember who you're feeding. So if you're feeding honeybees, um, you need sources all the way through the year. And if you're feeding um, solitary bees, you need to plan bloom for when they're going to be active. So in March, April, May, I know I've got to have really good floral resources for the mason bees. In June, July, August, got to have resources for the leafcutter bees. And then that down season between August and September is really a challenging time sometime to get really good resources. So you can find um, flowers that will bloom at that time and focus on those. One of my favorite uh, ways to find good native flowers for our area is the Oregon flora and it's easy, oregonflora.org. And you can go in and you can say, okay, um, I want to choose the right plant for my garden. And then I can specify what height, what width, if I want a certain flower color, um, when it blooms, I get really just focused down on what, what exactly I want. And then it gives me a list of all of the different native plants that would be suitable for my space. This is from the Garden Ecology uh, Lab, which is just has so much fascinating information. And they did a study on the diversity and abundance of bees on these native flowers. And the outer white circle represents bee abundance, just how many bees. Then the inner circle represents how many kinds of bees for each plant. And if you look at Douglas Aster, you can see that it not only has the most, the largest number of bees visiting it, but also the largest diversity of bees visiting it. But you can see some of these just have, um, just really fascinating, maybe a lot of bees, but not maybe so many diverse number of bees. So it's just kind of one way to look at what you're gonna to plan to plant. And then this is where our survey comes in. The abundance of honeybees on lavender does not necessarily mean it's a poor resource for native bees. So when people were thinking, okay, what, what are the plants that the bees like? And it's lavender. But if you look at your lavender full season, what you're mostly gonna see there are bumblebees and honeybees. And then, so you're, you've got a lot of bees, but very few different types of bees. So plants that support a wide diversity of bee species are really good to have in your garden as well. And take a look at the Douglas Aster. And that's an amazing plant to have. And it happily spreads, fair warning, um, but it's fairly easy to control. Um, the, hun the lavender is also a good place, good to have because there's a theory and it's being researched that if you have a lot of lavender, that's where the honeybees will go because it's used, they're used to that and it's easy and they like it. And, um, and so they will leave some of these other flowers alone to leave more pollen and nectar for native bees. And nurseries are always looking for the next best thing. We want it more colorful, more petals, more fragrance, smaller, taller. But in studies of what insects prefer, the results are mixed in terms of like, if you're having a cultivar or a native or, there's just really no hard and fast rules yet. 
But if you're purchasing a plant at the store and you want to have something that's really beneficial to bees, having something like this simple rose where it's easy to find the nectar and pollen as opposed to something with a lot of different leaves where it's really hard to get into and may not have as many, um, as much uh, nutrition resources. So if you're just shopping for bees, go simple. This is from Enhancing Urban and Suburban Landscapes to Protect Pollinators. And again, that's an uh, Oregon State Extension publication. And it's just got this, these are all native. Look at how beautiful that garden is going to be. Um, and, and it carries the different things it has. It's planting in, um, it's got areas for bees to plant here, a plant, mm, bees to nest. So with some dry soil, it's got swaths of flowers, different kinds of flowers throughout the blooming season and from wet to dry. So it's a good resource just to kind of say, okay, here's a, here's a place I could go to get some ideas. And then there's uh, plants here that are non-native and native mixed. And so many of the plants in the survey that people said, well, these are my favorites, were things that are not necessarily native, but are still really attractive and supportive of bees. So bee balm was on the top of the list, bluebeard, um, catmint or nepeta, black-eyed Susans. These are all plants that were um, people really talked about in terms of what they considered bee-friendly plants. So they're not native, but they're a great, uh, great pollinator source. And the last part of this is for your year-round floral resources. If you're going to put it in, oftentimes you will need to prepare your ground. And this is just, I put this in, this is a great way to get your site ready. It gives you several different methods of doing it organically and safely. Okay, number five, plant in swaths. I say swaths. Oftentimes the literature says blocks, but a block of flower just doesn't seem as lovely as a swath of flowers. So we're gonna talk about that. I think of this as the corner grocery store versus going to Costco. So, so many of our native bees are tiny, you know, quarter of an inch smaller, and they can only travel two to 400 feet between where they're nesting and where they need floral resources. Honeybees can travel miles. So the, the native small bees need a corner grocery store that's close by to them and they, that they can take advantage of. The honeybees can get in the car, go to Costco and get all of the massive things that they need. But the native bees need the corner grocery store. And in this corner grocery store, we have a swath of fireweed. We've got willow right here that can, um, on the right-hand side, that is a terrific uh, source for bees. And we have salal, and then some uh, agastache hyssop and some coneflowers that aren't quite blooming yet. And then some bare ground to, um, to nest in. And off to the right here, I've got a little water source too. So this is basically corner grocery store shopping and just an easy way to provide for bees. Now, when we talked about trees, I'm gonna talk about trees as swaths too because basically if you've got a flowering tree, you're taking up a lot of real estate. It's just vertical. So having flowering trees are a great way to have um, swaths, especially if you've got a small yard, you can have small trees growing into it. Number six, shop wisely. Pick the right plant for the right place so that you have a plant that's going to be healthy where it is and is much less uh, susceptible to disease and, and pathogens. There's nothing wrong with buying a cultivar or an ornamental. Just be aware that this may affect the nutrition, nutritional use of your plants to the pollinators. So here's a way to identify wild type native plants 
And this again is from the Garden Ecology Lab. And it basically goes through about how to, um, here's a cultivar, subspecies, straight species, cultivar mix. And so in this, we would normally say the cultivar, uh, the straight species would be most beneficial to bees, but some of these others have been proven to do just as well, maybe not quite as stellarly, but um, just know what you're buying. And then choose plants rich in nutrition. So recently we've just had a lot of development of sunflowers that they're called teddy bear sunflowers, or um, they're basically bred for uh, lots of lots of um, lots of um, petals, or they're bred so that they don't have any pollen, which gives them a longer vase life for um, people who are for florists. But they're really not good for bees. In the ones with lots of petals, the bees can't get to the pollen and nectar. And the ones that don't have pollen don't provide a nutritional, they may still have nectar, but they, they don't provide the nutritional resources of pollen. Pollen is basically protein for bees and nectar is basically carbohydrate. So you're, you're skipping out on the protein that they would need. Um, so, and there's a couple of, um, a few sunflowers that are really terrific pollen producers, Autumn Beauty, Lemon Queen, and Black Russian, all are great. And then there's the Great Sunflower Project that you can get involved in. And it's basically, they plant um, Lemon Queen sunflowers. And then you keep track of how many bees you have and how that all works. Well, just if you're interested in doing something like that, I mean, who doesn't want to grow sunflowers? They're so fun. Um, and then when you buy plants, make sure you get plants that have not been treated with neonex. So if you see this, the plant is protected from aphids and white flies and beetles and needle bugs, you know that it's been treated with neonicotinoids. So what you wanna buy is look for something that says, um, be safe, neonicotinoid free. You need to provide water. For your bees and I have seen bees don't need water well yeah yeah they do and to provide water you must have a source where they can sit on something and like basically like get their feet wet but not drown and I had a uh, basin bee nest where the bees had emerged before I was ready for them the only thing I had near there was a was a bird bath that didn't have any um pebbles or anything in it so it was a little bit too deep and the bees went to get water and they started drowning so I'm hauling mason and bees out of the bird bath and trying to save them and then I put some pebbles in so they could be safe but especially um, when we have like when we had the heat dome a couple of years ago it was really important to make sure that you had water available for the bees like in especially the heat of the day and everything when things were so dry just having something as simple as a dish with some pebbles and, a, and water in it would really make a big difference. Okay, if you want to have nascent bees, or I'm sorry, native bees in your yard, you need to provide nesting materials and nesting sites. And you could purchase nesting materials if you're just looking for mason bees and leaf cutter beads, but all the other bees need things like pithy stems, um, Bare, bare ground. Um, some even will do um, empty snail cases, but that's not something you're going to provide. But a great way to do it is to have a, uh, a brush pile, basically. And it's really easy when you're cleaning up your yard to not just take them all to the dumpster or, you know, compost heap, but set aside where you're going to provide pithy stems in there and things like raspberries, um, milkweed, um, anything that has kind of a hollow stem is, is a great resource to put in there. The bees can find it. And then underneath that would be bare ground. Now the problem thinking about bare ground and mulch, um, you need to, we all like to have mulch, but leave some spaces 
for the bees to get to as well. And they can be underneath little rock piles and just feathered out like by the trees and stuff where you just have some spaces where you've got dry, uncovered ground. Here's multi-use real estate. This is an old birch trunk and it's got some sedum in it. So I've got pithy stems, rotting logs. There's a bare ground underneath and there's water right behind right beside here. This is a bee magnet, folks, got to tell you. Okay, things to avoid. So avoid overhead irrigation, because if that happens during the middle of the day, and your uh, bee that has been in a solitary nest in underground, it's going to get muddy, and it could cover up her hole, and she's not going to be able to find it. So if you're going to have overhead irrigation, do it at night when they're asleep. Uh, weed cloth, obviously, they can't get to the ground if you've got weed cloth all over it. So save that for like paths and just very special places where you just absolutely need to keep weeds down. Um, working the soil too early and then rotor tiller does not do anything for bee nests. Um, so basically try and adopt a no-till gardening. Minimizing lawn, you've heard it, you've heard it. Um, the thing to, you know, you can plant um, pollinator gardens, you can plant um, lawn substitutes, but be careful if you're planting, like you say, okay, I'm gonna plant a wildflower garden where I had this, had this lawn. Make sure you take a look at the mix of seeds that you have because so many of the wildflower mixes do not have what is native to our areas. So you can have to look and kind of make sure that you've got a seed mix that is going to be native to our area and not just something that's gonna become invasive and take over. The last thing is to embrace a more relaxed landscape. I originally said embrace messiness, but relaxed sounds nicer. So when the Year is done, the flowers are done. Don't cut everything down. If you have to cut down like your taller flowers, leave about 12 to 18 inches above the ground and that provides sources for bees to nest in. You've heard it, you've heard it. Leave the leaves. Leaves are terrific for um, like um, honeybees will often just kind of find a little place underneath the pile of leaves and that's where they will overwinter. Um, don't use a shredder on your leaves because there could be critters in there that you want to save. Um, and then using pruning from trees and shrubs, make a, make a brush pile. And they don't have to be ugly. I've seen some really attractive uh, brush piles made into a teepee shape. So this right now, doesn't look so great. It's, you know, we have to embrace the embrace the messiness. But in a few months, it looks like this. It's just basically the life cycle. And that's where we've got a happy, healthy bee population. And then I have lots and lots of resources that you'll be getting in your list. And I think we're ready for questions. Leah, that was wonderful. So many beautiful pictures and so much good information. I will tell you that most of the questions we got has to do with the mason bees, but I'll start with a couple other ones first. Okay. And one is um, this person wants the best bees for a vegetable garden. Okay, the best bees for a vegetable garden, if you wanna do managed bees, are gonna be leaf cutter bees. And I don't have a lot of experience with that. Um, I will be doing my first leaf cutter installation this summer, but they do, they're great at um, tomatoes, squash, no, not squash so much, um, cucumbers, things like that. Um, so you could try putting some out or even just putting out a house and see if you can encourage them into your yard. Other than right. that, just having, part of what you want to have in your vegetable garden is to plant flowers that bees will always like anyway. So borage, right. um, what if you've got, like you've that. got fabulous yes. gardens. Yes. What do you plant? 
around your vegetable um, I garden? plant a lot of those insectary plants, like you talk about, ones that are supposed to uh, bring the beneficial insects in and mm -hmm. also brings the bees in. So a lot of those that you're uh, that are on your list also. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We have another question that wasn't a Mason related, and she wanted to know kind of the pros and cons of having a clover yard instead of a grass clover. Lawn. Clover yards are wonderful, and they're just uh, terrific bee sources. The uh, cons, it depends on what you're looking for in your yard. Um, but they're. And say the only con might be if you are allergic to bees, you might step on one. That's true. You know, and but, yes. <laughs> but it's other so than that, yo. most bees don't sting. And that's what people, true. you know, now if you've got a clover lawn, you're going to get honeybees. But right. um, yeah. So yes, don't do clover lawn <laughs> if you're going to walk out barefoot. Okay. The rest Good of the point. questions we had, people were really interested in, in your mason bees. One is, you know, we're going to be having some really nice weather coming up. And this person said they didn't have any trees flowering right now. They're, they're apple trees and things. So is this weekend going to be too early to put the mason bees back out? I think so. And here's one of the reasons is that we, yes, it'll be sunny and warm. Like at my house, I've got quite a bit of Pieris and the uh, the red flowering current are just starting, but I think it's too early. And, you know, it's been such crazy weather. We could get another real cold snap. And so okay. I would not put them out this year. And when I do put them out, I put them out in batches. So like, I'll say, okay, this uh, looks like I'm going to have a good, you know, five days of really beautiful weather. I'll put out some, and then I'll wait two weeks and put out some more because I have had the experience of, putting them out and then getting a cold snap and it rains for for five or ten days and they just don't have the resources to sustain right. life and they die so okay. yes i think this week is a this is a little bit too early okay good good advice um this person has the commercially made mason bee homes and they don't have the parts that you can't remove them and clean them so she wants to know how is she going to clean them what should she do or should she just ditch them um, if she wants to send me a picture, um, you know, through the website, that would be fine. I don't know because commercially made it's, you know, it could be the little things that you get at Costco that are absolutely useless. Or sometimes there's like laminate blocks that you can get, but if that you could, that you could put the nesting tubes in the little white nesting mm -hmm. tubes. I like yeah. the ones that are pre-slit. If those will fit in, then you could put those in and then take them out. But if she sends me a picture, I'd be happy to talk to her about it. Okay. So she can just send it to 10 minute you 2017 at gmail.com. Right. Okay, great. All right. Um, now you talked about not using pesticides. So this person wants to know, um, having non-native ladybugs, bringing them into your area, is that good? And sh can she be using neem oil and diatomaceous earth? Neem oil and diatomaceous earth um, are more acceptable than pesticides. We'll start with that. You know, Jane, I think you probably have a better answer on those than I do. Well, yes. I know that a lot of those products say that they do not harm beneficials, but you know that they have to harm some beneficials yeah. just by the way they, they work. Um, and of course, you can talk about, it's not a good idea to bring ladybugs into the area. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't. You know, I, I'm thrilled when I find them, you know, but yes. I, I'm i not a big fan of buying something from someplace else. And, you know, one of the Mason Bee stories is, is we have a, a new Mason Bee, not new, uh, in the area. It's Osmia Cornifrons. It's Japanese uh, Mason Bee. And they were brought in to the East Coast to help pollinate the apple trees. And they have since taken over. Um, in the East Coast. Now they're here in the West Coast. And I'm kind of like, they're good bees. I mean, they they do a job. But if you have something that works well, why bring in something from that could take over? And these these yeah. guys, they come out before the mason bees. Um, they will do, they will lay 11 to 12 eggs per tube, whereas our native will only lay six or seven. So it's just, it, it puts a lot of pressure on the native on bees. On the native ones. So, okay. Yeah. Now, this person said she's seen in stores, they sell pollen 
that is specifically for honeybees? You wanted to know if that would work for mason bees? I don't know the answer to that question. Well, we actually want our mason bees to be pollinating our trees. So, yeah. so don't, what, we instead of giving it to them, we want them to be out in the out in nature, don't we? Yes. Now the last Thank the you, last question is a, the last question is a pretty good one, and there's several people that have problems. This Houdini fly. Yes. Can you explain a little bit more about its life cycle and how are we going to take care of it? You you talked about she, this person mentioned you talked about cleaning the mason bees helps, but now it's too late if you haven't cleaned your mason bees. So. Would you talk a little bit more about the Houdini fly? Yes, absolutely. Um, if you have not cleaned your mason bees, the best way to take care of that right now is when you put your mason bees out, you put them out in a like a mesh um, bag that you can see through. And then as the bees hatch, you have to check it, you know, every day or so. If you see a Houdini fly and they're little tiny, you just squish it and then you let the mason bees out. So that's oh. one way to pro solve that problem right now. And I have several people that I know that have, um, oh, I didn't clean it. And I'm kind of going, I'm, I'm just getting really particular about that is because it's, this is something we can do to help save the mason bees. And okay. let's just do it. So yeah, okay. so mesh bag, put the put the um, bees in there, and then when they hatch, let them out. But then squish the Houdini flies first. If in, if you're doing it in the fall and you're getting ready to clean them and you open up your straw, what does the Houdini fly look like at that time? What's its life cycle right then in the it fall? It is it is a uh, larva, basically. So it's a very okay. sticky larva, and there'll be like, you know, five or ten all in one little area. So there's just okay. a clump of sticky white larva. So they are, if if you had mason bees out there right now, those Houdini flies are, they have they already emerged from their larvae? Have they, have they pupated and then? I do not flies? know that. I would think, okay. I would think so. I have not experienced that because I clean mine in the fall. But right. since they come out at about the same time, I would think that, that that's what you, and that's why they recommend um, putting it in a mesh bag because they're going to be coming out at the same time. Okay. So, yes. Well, great. Well, that's all the questions we had. Thank you, Leah. That was wonderful. Really appreciate it. Thank I'm you. Sure everyone else Thank did you, too. Thank you.